It is really my great pleasure to uh, introduce the next speaker. Uh, Chitra Krishnan is a, uh, a member of our medical advisory board and has been very actively involved in our community for many years. Um, <laughs> And we truly love Chitra, so it's my honor to introduce her this morning. Uh, Chitra and Dr. Kaplan are going to do the next presentation. Am I going to wait for Adam? Yes, because we're splitting our talk in two. I talk for the first 10 minutes and then he takes over. Okay. What? Okay. Okay, so we all heard from Dr. Bowen about uh, the use of very high dose immunosuppression followed by stem cell transplantation, either autologous or allogeneic. So I'm going to talk to you about immunoblation without stem cell transplantation. Um, so in the last couple of days, you've heard that MS is a heterogeneous disease. The currently approved FDA drugs are partially effective, um, and majority of patients continue to accrue disability. Um, I'll go back a little bit to talk about cyclophosphamide. So it is a very non-specific immunosuppressant. It doesn't just attack T cells or B cells, and your, um, you know, the, your immune system is suppressed, but eventually this is a transient suppression, so it comes back to baseline. Cytoxan has been used in MS for a very long time. Results have been very mixed. People have been concerned about toxicity. Um, it's been used, as Dr. Bowen said, in, um, as a conditioning regimen before transplantation. It's, it spares your hematopoietic stem cells, and, that's, uh, and you know, patients do very well. So in terms of how the mechanism of how um, cyclophosphamide works, it's a very complex slide, but all the take-home message from it is cyclophosphamide ultimately gets metabolized to what's called phosphamide mustard, and that's the toxin that kills the immune cells. So... Uh, what is refractory autoimmune disease? So, you know, um, patients who've been on conventional uh, agents and they've failed all these therapies. Side effects are too many. Uh, the comorbidities either because they can't tolerate them and there is need to constantly keep going and changing your therapies. So we thought that's where hematopoietic stem cell transplantation came in. I'm not going to go into this because Dr. Bowen already did. Um, and as he showed, it's been effective in halting disease in 75 to 80% of the patients for variable duration of time. And there has been a decrease in the lesion load, um, but mortality has been shown to be between 5 and 15%, and Dr. Bowman's latest data showed there was about 7%. So what does high psi do? It's immune ablation without transplantation. So basically, you kill all the mature and maturing white blood cells. The bone marrow stem cells are preserved. They do not die because they have an enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase that prevents them from dying. And then you essentially give them a factor called GCSF, and then you coax them to now form a brand new immune system that you hope is going to be naive. And that's called rebooting the immune system. What are the advantages? It's much lower cost. It's about 30,000, and I think uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation costs about 300,000, and much lower mortality as well. So this study was published about three weeks ago in the Archives of Neurology. So I'm going to go through some of the data and uh, give you what we presented, and then Dr. Kaplan will take over and talk about where we are with the next phase of these studies. So 21 patients were screened. We enrolled nine patients between October 2003 and July 2006. All these patients had aggressive relapsing remitting MS, which means they either had gadolinium enhancing lesions and they were active. They had to have that. And uh, they continued to progress. They had exacerbations and their EDSS continued to worsen. So they were, um, you know, the study went through our IRB. We uh, screened, uh, we consented them to, to participate in the study, do a whole bunch of pre-treatment evaluations where they get EKGs and echocardiograms and uh, chest CTs to make sure there are no other conditions that would put them at risk. And then the actual study is they get 50 milligrams per kilogram per day of cytoxin, which is a lot of cytoxin. 
And so at the end, I'll show you a graph in a bit where um, basically after six, seven, eight days, there is zero white blood cells. Um, at which point you give them GCSF, and then you follow until the white blood cell count comes back up again. The main focus of our study was safety. It's a phase one, two, to see, okay, we'll do it in a small pilot manner, and we'll see if this is safe in MS patients. <coughs> we also looked at radiology and EDSS to see if disability changed. So this is the, um, this table is complicated, but it basically shows the nine patients who were in the study. Six of them were male, three were female. They all had disease for anywhere between a year and a half to 15 years. Uh, their baseline EDSS was about five, ranged from 1.5 to seven. And they all had, you know, many gut enhancing lesions ranging from three and a half to 10. So this graph basically shows that, so minus four is the first day they get cytoxin. Zero is the last day they get cytoxin. As you can see, by day six, their counts have dropped to zero, essentially. And then you give GCSF. <coughs> and that's when the blood counts then come back. So it takes about 10 to 14 days for the counts to come back. <coughs> Since this is a safety study, um, you know, I have, we looked at all the adverse events, if there were any. There were no deaths in the nine patients that we enrolled in the study, no life-threatening adverse events. There was one um, episode of confusion for one patient, but that patient also had other medical comorbidities. Um, there were four ER or hospitalization visits. Um, two patients, and I'll show you that data again, did not do well on this therapy. They actually reactivated. <coughs> um, so in terms of side effects of high side treatment, um, nausea, people lose temporary hair loss, anemia, leukopenia. So for the time that they are not on any other, uh, they don't have any immune system, essentially it's right down to zero cells. Sorry, I do need water. <coughs> Um, so at, at the time that they have no white blood cells, essentially no immune system, they are given antifungals, antivirals, and antibiotics to prevent any infections. All patients actually get re-immunized after one year. Okay, so this basically shows, um, so EDSS, as you've all heard, is the disability scale. From zero to 10, zero is normal, 10 is death. So basically time zero is the baseline when they enter the study. Um, so, 36 months on, we, we went back 36 months to see how they were doing. And, you know, basically, the patients kept getting worse and worse and worse. They kept progressing. And then at time zero, they were given cytoxin. And you can see the green box basically shows how two patients actually didn't do well on the study. The others more or less kept getting better. The EDSS decreased. So overall of the nine patients, if you looked at disability, four of them um, either had no change or had a very small change in disability, a very small improvement in disability. Five of the nine patients actually improved by at least one point on the ADSS scale. Um, so this, the red line shows the number of GAD-enhancing lesions. The black line shows their EDSS, the two y-axes. So EDSS, say for these people who had no disease activity, there were no clinical exacerbation, there were no GAD-enhancing lesions for the time that they were followed. These three patients actually had reactivation by MRI that did not correlate with disability. So they had no clinical exacerbation, but when patients kept coming back every three months and we do an MRI, they said they were fine, but their MRI had a lesion. Two, pe two patients in the study, patient one and five, both had clinical and radiological um, um, signs that the disease had reactivated. Our last patient has still not completed uh, follow-up. I think it's due to complete very soon. Carrie knows that. So if you looked overall at how patients did uh, in, in, in terms of disability, there was actually a 40% decrease in disability in these patients. 
And we also looked at MSFCs. MSFC is actually a scale that is used to look at um, three things, motor function, uh, well, how, how much they walk, how, a time 25-foot walk, and you look at uh, a nine-hole peg test for the upper arm extremity test, and cognition, which is the pace set. In all of these measures, actually, the patients did better. There was no statistical significance in nine-hole peg test. This graph shows what happened to their MRI. So they had, on an average, about seven GAD-enhancing lesions in the nine patients at baseline, at follow-up about one. So there was an 81% decrease in GAD-enhancing lesions. So to summarize, I've already said that the average decrease in EDSS of all nine patients was about 40%. Five patients had a functional response. The average improvement in MSFC was about 87%. The MRI activity with double-dose GAD, there was an 81% reduction in GAD-enhancing lesions. So in these nine patients, uh, very preliminary phase one study, we have to do a, a larger study to prove these results, and Dr. Kaplan will talk about it. But we do show that it can, um, it induces rapid and sustained clinical and radiologic improvement. The fact that there was a 40% reduction in baseline disability at 23 months is very encouraging to go on and do a larger study. So at this point, I will hand over to Adam. So um, that trial uh, that you saw there was uh, essentially Doug's brainchild, and he came to Chitra, and as everything has been going for the last nine years, he said, okay, Chitra, make this happen. And uh, under his intellectual guidance, she put together the, the study and ran it and recruited the patients. And uh, I had the privilege of working with them both uh, as one of the data safety monitoring uh, people and also uh, I was the psychiatrist called in because, as I talked about yesterday, there's a high psychiatric comorbidity, so some of these patients had issues with their mood or cognition. Um, and the involvement in this was one of the most exciting clinical trials I'd been involved in. And I came to Doug and Chitra uh, uh, one afternoon, and I said, look, this is great. Uh, how's the data look? I mean, we, we'd seen people do things that have never been reported before. Uh, and in the small group discussion we had over in this corner, people were asking, um, essentially, you know, what do you know that might be available that could conceivably decrease disability? And we've never seen this before. This has never been published, a study, even though I would echo uh, Chitra's precautions in over-interpreting nine patients, still, it had never been seen before that you could take patients and not just freeze them in time with, with regard to uh, worsening of their disability, but actually show improvement. And although she's absolutely correct, uh, and by the way, we had to have Chitra present this because not only was she the one who designed it, and uh, she's going to come back, she's making a getaway, um, but not only did she um, uh, sort of uh, you know, uh, work with Doug closely and uh, under his guidance carry out this study, but uh, she knows the data better than any of us do because she was with these patients. But what was um, remarkable is that they got dramatically better, and although she quoted correctly 40% total across the nine, in EDSS, remember, there was almost a 90% response by the MSFC, the Multiple Sclerosis Functional Exam, and that's just remarkable. I mean, we had one person who went from essentially requiring wheelchair to go any distance to now running. And that was unheard of. Um, but there was one problem, which is um, based on what Dr. Bowen had shown you, you know, there was evidence of uh, you know, ongoing activity by the MRI. These people had sort of quieted down. And that suggested that we had sort of found the control alt delete button on the immune system, but we hadn't reformatted the hard drive or provided antiviral software to protect it, you know, if you will, analogy here, antiviral software to protect the bug in the machine from coming back. And so I worked with Doug and Chitra and to devise uh, ideas for how we might be able to prevent that from happening, because if you're going to put someone through a risk of completely wiping out their immune system, you want to make sure that it has a sustained benefit and that it won't just bounce back. This, by the way, this trial had been, this treatment had been used, for instance, in myasthenia gravis and lupus, uh, lupus in particular, a very aggressive and bad disease, as uh, Julius Birnbaum had talked about previously. And they don't use it there because of the level of reactivation. 
Uh, so the real issue was if we're going to take the chance and we have something here that could lead to significant improvements, how could we lock in those improvements? Now, I have been late to the ball here in terms of bragging rights about children, so I had to show this picture of my daughter. So, uh, so I, when I got home, she wouldn't hear about that I'd ignored her. But this is my daughter who's, uh, according to Doug, exactly to the day, nine months uh, 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 older than, um, than his daughter. And I think I'd like to think it was the inspiration of seeing my daughter <laughs> that, uh, that ultimately inspired Doug and his wife. But uh, as, as you will find, uh, playing pool with Doug, he's a remarkably good shot. So, <laughs> um, so, uh, so essentially, the issue is one of how do we um, you know, talk, you know, how do we consider the safety of this treatment? And this is the best we have, which is we've done, uh, when I say we, I really sort of mean the royal we. This work has largely been championed outside of MS by uh, Rob Brodsky and Rick Jones, who deserve, and you know, if um, Rob Brodsky and Rick Jones uh, ever see this, this, this video and it sees the light of day, I have to give them full credit. They, they were crazy and insane enough to think, gee, we can do this and essentially give a bone marrow transplant to people without the bone marrow transplant. So wipe out the entire immune system, and this had only been shown in animals to be theoretically possible, and they actually took this to humans and had the unbelievable uh, um, tenacity or, uh, you know, uh, chutzpah, I guess, would be, right, Sandy, chutzpah? So it would be the chutzpah to, uh, to think of doing this in humans. And uh, right now, there, there have been, probably right now, because Carrie uh, and, uh, and Ed have been so aggressive in recruiting people, we're probably up more than the 220 or 230 people have undergone this high psi immunoablation. Um, there has, in terms of serious uh, uh, side effects, three episodes of neuropenic septus, neuro, uh, sepsis, neuropenic meaning that there weren't enough white blood cells around at that time, sepsis meaning that they had a bacterial infection that sort of went wild in their system. They were seriously ill and they required antibiotics and they recovered fully. There was one intensive care unit admission and again lead to a full recovery. There was one patient who died while immunosuppressed after the high psi. And so that is why one in 200, we quote a one in 200 chance of mortality with this study. But I will say that this was a rather unusual death, uh, unusual enough that it resulted in this New England Journal of Medicine publication, which is that it was, this individual was one of the three deaths that was reported in this New England Journal of Medicine article where the manufacturer of this bronchoscope, this was a patient who was being treated for a lung, an autoimmune lung disease, and this uh, bronchoscope that they were doing to monitor and see if they'd cleared up the uh, injury to the lungs was infected with a very aggressive, very bad uh, bacteria that kills people with cystic fibrosis uh, called Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And it killed people even who weren't in this study. So it's, it's no question that this person died as a result of high psi because they didn't have an immune system to fight this off, but other people died uh, as well because they got this bad. So, but however, we do quote the one in 200 because we don't want to bury that or pretend it didn't happen. And it is only by doing thousands of patients will we really know what the, what the true risk is. So how to improve the treatment? And essentially, we thought about this in two ways. One is we'd like to improve the efficacy and minimize the adverse outcomes and therefore, you know, find a way to say who's going to do well and how might we maximize their improvement and how can we, um, you know, then prevent reactivation of the disease. And of course, if we could predict response to treatment, we could then select patients, either select patients who are going to do well ahead of time or maybe find ways of optimizing the treatment in those people who wouldn't do well. And to begin with, the thinking as, as Chitra, uh, you know, explained and described, the thinking was to try to find out why some patients show reactivation. And there was a rough correlation, but again, we only had nine patients, so it was only a rough correlation, but made sense based on sort of the biology here of those patients who had white blood cell counts that were relatively, that didn't go to zero, but were relatively elevated, meaning 50 or 100 white blood cells per cubic millimeter surviving the high side treatment, those patients seem to reactivate. And that makes sense, because if you don't wipe out the old immune system, it's going to reactivate. And the question is, why would the immune system persist? And the thought process was, gee, if the reasons why the bone marrow cells persist is because they have this enzyme 
this ALDH, uh, aldehyde dehydrogenase, um, essentially inactivates this drug and allows them to survive. Maybe there's a pocket of immune cells that express this and survive, sort of like the way I think of them is, uh, so aldehyde dehydrogenase breaks down this drug, alcohol dehydrogenase breaks down alcohol, and because Irish men and women uh, happen to you know, have high levels of al alcohol dehydrogenase, they're the ones walking out of the bar you know, steady and, and no problem. So these are sort of the Irishmen of the immune system, we thought, maybe uh, walking out here uh, looking just fine. And what we found was here, this is statistical data that Chitra crunched for us, that shows when we measured the aldehyde dehydrogenase in the T cells in particular, those are the cells that get taken out in HIV, they're the generals of the immune system, those, uh, those patients uh, whose adult cells, just drawn from their, from their you know, peripheral vein, expressed high levels of aldehyde dehydrogenase, um, which is shown on the x-axis, had showed high levels of white blood cell counts remaining. And there was a correlation of 0.8, <clears throat> which is somewhat remarkable because there were only nine patients that we studied. So this suggested to us now that we have an assay that we can actually use to predict those people who have high levels of aldehyde dehydrogenase in their T cells are the ones who don't respond as well, and perhaps we need to up the dose or change what we're doing or add something to it, but we can predict now better uh, knowing something about the biology. And then the issue was how do you then prevent the reactivation? And um, this took us back to, uh, this is sort of, it's, it's always good to know your history, right? And so one of the historical facts uh, of one of the first treatments, uh, in fact, the first treatment that was um, found, although it wasn't the first to come to market, one of the first treatments uh, that was found to improve the outcome in multiple sclerosis was copaxone. And probably many of you have heard of this, uh, this treatment. It is a peptide, a polypeptide, which means a string of amino acids, a short uh, protein, and it's a random set of sequences of short proteins which essentially look a little bit like um, myelin. And what was happening back in the 40s and 50s was before they can actually sequence or, or design proteins, they could randomly generate these sequences that had the amino acid mix that was found in myelin. Again, remember, as Ben described, the insulation around the wires, uh, around the axons in the, in the nervous system. And what they were thinking is, gee, we can give these animals an animal model of multiple sclerosis. And the way you do that is you take myelin and you immunize an animal with myelin, and basically after about two weeks, that animal, having been immunized, raising antibodies, raising an immune response, will start to develop um, in, in, in the models that we're studying in the lab, this relapsing remitting course of attacks of their spinal cord. Um, and this is a, you know, the best model we have for an animal MS. And when they were doing this, they had to kill these animals to purify the myelin to inject into these animals to cause this animal model of MS. So they said, gee, wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to kill these animals? We'll just synthesize this short stretch of proteins, uh, short proteins, and then use them, because they look like myelin, to inject them into these animals and give them this animal MS without having to kill these animals. And they, pure, you know, they purified this protein and they injected it into these animals. No MS, no signs. Okay, are you with me so far? Okay. <clears throat> and then they said, well, that's a bust. But someone had the idea, well, maybe this boosts the ability of myelin to, to ca cause this MS-like illness in these animals. So they injected the copaxone with the myelin that they purified over here. And what they were shocked to find um, is in the lower panel uh, here, where they essentially give the copaxone at the same time, day zero, that they gave the myelin, the black here shows that if they don't give the copaxone, these animals actually got so sick that they died. They developed really bad uh, animal MS. However, the lower bar shows that, and this is different sequences of that protein, that if you immunized at the same time with the copaxone, you prevented the onset of MS. So they were jumping around the lab. They said, great, we've got a treatment that prevents MS. And they said, that's super. Let's go talk to the pharmaceutical companies. And they said, oh, but how do you predict who's going to get MS? There's no way of knowing. So that was a problem. Uh, so they then did this other set of experiments where they gave them the myelin in the top panel. 
And, uh, and then only after they started to develop symptoms did they give them the copaxone. And you can see rather than death, they improved, but they didn't improve the way that they were able to improve if they gave it beforehand. What we then thought, and this is the mental leap, it, I hope it sounds obvious now, but at the time it wasn't so obvious, is what we thought is that effectively what Doug and Chitra had done was created a situation where we had patients who essentially were like this. They no longer had any activity. They didn't have gadolinium enhancing lesions. They didn't have exacerbations. And essentially to an MRI uh, assessment and a clinical assessment, these patients didn't have MS. Now, uh, Dr. Bowen would rightly say, but did you check the oligoclonal bands and maybe there were T B cells? And I would say, absolutely correct. I mean, I'm not saying we completely eradicated it, but maybe we eradicated it enough that it would stay dormant um, if we could prevent it from reactivating. Bless you. So the mental jump was to say, gee, the original use of this protein was to do this. Uh, and that is where our future uh, sort of lies with this. Now, I'm not going to get into all of the biology, but essentially a T cell, in order to get angry and go into the brain and start attacking, has to be presented with myelin from an, what's called an antigen-presenting cell. And what the glutaramer acetate, which is the generic name of Copaxon, Copaxon is the company name, gets into that communication between these antigen-presenting cells that are saying, go get this and attack. Um, it gets in there and it blocks the ability of myelin to cause that injury. It shifts these cells into regulatory cells that are actually helpful in preventing reactivation. And it also looks like it leads to the production of growth factors in the brain that may lead to even repair of the nervous system. So does that make sense? I know it's sort of very complicated, but. And what was interesting just by way of the history, even before we did this, I sort of have to justify why we were crazy enough to actually take this into human trials, is that this copaxone has already been shown not only to prevent myelin basic protein induced MS models in animals, but it pre prevented uveo retinitis, which is inflammation of the retina and uvea. It, re it also prevented rejection of grafts against host and graft versus host disease, host against graft, so you could then transplant tissue, and this copaxone was also good at preventing that. So it looked like it had a relatively nonspecific and also experimental inflammatory bowel disease. It also prevents in animal models, and that's why Carrie's crazy enough to think she can do this in Crohn's disease uh, and use the same treatment that is a trial that uh, she's helping to coordinate uh, using this exact same trial in Crohn's disease. So again, you know, hopefully like the, those of you who have been to conferences previously have heard is that you know, TM, transverse myelitis, but it's also transforming medicine, MS is, and the work we're doing at MS and TM, we hope will have a uh, bleed over into, well, perhaps a bad choice of analogy, but will allow us to develop other treatments uh, that are useful. And even, uh, even now, uh, there have been some reports that have suggested that this copaxone is being tried in, tr in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, tr disease, Parkinson's disease, ALS, and CNS trauma, and that probably has more to do with its ability to promote growth factors and prevent um, that kind of injury. Now, what makes us think that there will be any usefulness to this? Well, one thing is that uh, Teva, who makes Copaxone, has published this study at the end of last year where they took 481 patients who had clinically isolated syndromes, which means they had one attack. And remember, multiple sclerosis requires multiple attacks. So clinically isolated syndrome is basically the way of defining someone who has what looks like it's going to be MS, but they've only had one attack and they're at significant increased risks of going on to develop MS. And what they did was they randomized the placebo or copaxone, followed them for three years. So this is not a wimpy study. This is a you know, million dollar study. And then they studied whether, how long it took them to get to another attack or whether they progressed to MS. And again, this is more like, not exactly like preventing MS because they've already had one hit, but it's more like that because they're preventing them from going from that one hit to another hit and they saw almost a 50% reduction at three years, 43% on the placebo had progressed to MS, only 25% on the copaxone. That sort of suggested to us, gee, this is, this is good. And while we were thinking about doing this, a, a paper was published as we were getting sort of money together to do this that was using mitoxantrin or nervantrin, which is a chemotherapy agent that is already FDA approved to treat refractory multiple sclerosis. And it's a rather toxic drug in the sense that you have to give it for a year. You can't give it any more than a year because it has 
uh, lethal effects potentially on the heart. It can cause real trouble with the heart. It can also cause the, uh, acute leukemia because it's a chemotherapy agent that messes with DNA and it can cause leukemia. But what's really remarkable is here on the, on the left side, all of those black diamonds show the rate of uh, exacerbations in these patients. Then they go on to mitoxantrone where that line is and then they were on mitoxantrone and glutamic acid for a little while and then just on to glutamic acid, which I'm sorry, again, is copaxone. And what you can see is how active they were here, then they get the chemotherapy agent and the copaxone and how quiet they are there. Again, suggesting you could really shut it down. Now, there were two patients that continued to have activation, but unfortunately in this study, one patient out of this uh, 27 patients developed an acute leukemia. Uh, so it is a potentially toxic treatment. It doesn't take the white blood cell count down to zero, but it did suggest that if you combine chemotherapy with copaxone, you potentially have uh, a, a good treatment. Now, I don't mean to rail on Novantrone too much. If you're on Novantrone, you're on it because other medicines have failed and you needed an aggressive treatment. And again, the, the rate of leukemia is relatively low, but they did see one case here. So we went into the lab, and uh, this is work done uh, that, that, that I've uh, been doing in collaboration with Doug in his lab. And we just said, can we recreate um, animal EAE, and as you can see here, we immunize these animals, and this is sort of like an EDSS score here, uh, worsening disability, and they got an attack after about 10 to 12 days, and then they had this undulating course, okay, much like MS. So we could recreate this in the lab. And then we said, well, gee, let's give them high psi. So at this point, about here, uh, day 15, they were given high psi, and rather than have that ongoing undulating course, you see they got better. And then uh, at about between day 30 and 40, we gave them 10 days of copaxone, just 10 days. And what you can see here is that those animals in the blue got the copaxone, and those animals in the purple just got saline. They, didn't, they got the control. And what we did was just giving them 10 days of copaxone, we delayed the reactivation of that injury, that animal model of MS, by 10 days. This just shows the same thing, which is this is called a survival curve. In this case, survival just represents how long it took them to become reactivated and go on to illness. And again, the blue represents those that got the copaxone at a, had a much lower rate of reactivation and a much slower rate of reactivation than those animals that got placebo. Does that make sense? So we're just showing in an animal model we could do it. So it looked like it was a reasonable thing to do. And when you have animal models, then you want to go back to uh, human trials and very carefully, very tentatively, uh, see if you can recreate the same thing. Now, I will tell you, though, that copaxone is a remarkably safe treatment. It doesn't cripple the immune system, although you never know what things are going to do when you combine them together, the copaxone and the cyclophosphamide, the high side. But this represents the work that Carey uh, has done, uh, largely uh, working now with the baton passing to her with Ed Hammond. Um, again, under Doug's uh, direction and, uh, and, 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 uh, and with, with my assistance to do this RICO trial. So RICO uh, just stands for Revimune Copaxone, the company that has now patented this use of high-dose cyclophosphamide, wants to call it Revimune, or it does call it Revimune, and so it's Revimune Copaxone, and RICO just sounded, you know, RICO Suave, it sounded sort of cool. Um, you always look for some cool thing to call your thing. And you can see here that much like Chitra presented before, patients who had had, and, and also what Dr. Bowen had, had presented, that those patients who had high disability to begin with didn't show a significant improvement. They just stayed at the same EDSS score, just like the two patients who had six and a half on their EDSS score. But those patients who had had um, you know, lower levels of disability sh to begin with showed a significant decrease. So again, we're continuing to see this decrease in disability. And this is as far as we've gotten right now. There are these other patients that you see sitting there at time zero have just recently been recruiting. Uh, Carrie is a mean, lean recruiting machine, and so she has managed to get far more people than, uh, than we, uh, you know, all at one time in sort of a bolus. So we're not going to have to follow these patients going forward. But what I can tell you is we are seeing this, I would say, historic repeat of what, what Chitra showed and, and was originally published. Um, uh, of this decrease in disability. And right now, what isn't shown on this slide is that nobody so far 
has shown any reactivation by MRI and no clinical exacerbations. Now, why aren't they jumping up and down? Because the two patients that are out the longest are nine months. And with the reactivation in the data that Chitar showed you, one patient showed reactivation at six months, another patient at 12 months, and another patient at 20 months. So we're far too early to declare any kind of victory here. All we can say is so far, these patients are tolerating this combined treatment, and we hope, based on the animal data and the data I showed you, uh, that these patients will not reactivate. And if that's the case, then perhaps we found a way of doing a long-term treatment that will prevent the inflammation and then immunize them now with Copaxone, not to treat the MS, but to prevent the MS from coming back. Does that make sense? It's sort of a different way of thinking about it. And so, you know, Leonardo da Vinci said, I've been impressed with the urgency of doing. Knowing is not enough, we must apply. Being willing is not enough, we must do. These are very aggressive. Those of you who know Doug uh, know that he would rather do something than just sit there. Uh, and, you know, seeing patients and having a chance to come here to these conferences and seeing people uh, whose lives are being affected uh, dramatically, um, this is a dramatic treatment. And I'm not saying this is the treatment to run out and get. Um, although Ting was promoting it yesterday because his wife had had a similar kind of treatment. But I'd say it's too early to jump up and down. But I just wanted you to know that at least as far as the initial set of patients that we've done, this is, this is evidence that people are now working, you know, in conjunction with the hematopoietic stem cell transplants on coming up with a treatment that I think would begin to meet criteria for a cure. Cure is a four-letter word. It's a bad word. You don't want to promise people a cure. But when I say a cure, what I mean is it's a treatment that we think, at least theoretically, um, could lead to long-term remissions where people don't accrue disability and they can go about you know, their lives as the person in the high side trial that's out the longest, I think, is five years now. And he has, you know, he's one of the three that shows no evidence of activation. So you know, we hope, ultimately, with this aggressiveness, to have a smile on our face, as Leonardo uh, demonstrated here. Again, all of this was done under the uh, uh, guidance of Doug, so I have to acknowledge him and Peter's head of the MS Center, Rob Brodsky and Rick Jones, um, developed this treatment in, outside of MS. And Carlos and Ben, who are here, have been instrumental in referring patients. Ed Hammond um, and Carrie Trecker have been recruiting the patients, and Megan has been doing a lot of the data analysis for us, uh, so you can pat them on the backs if you see them.